Hello and good evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you are uh, based right now. Thank you again for joining one of our live sessions with our principal wildlife contributing photographers. Uh, my name is Marion. I'm one of the two co-founders of the fundraiser. And today I'm joined by the lovely Priti and Prashant Chakro from Nairobi, Cairo, uh, Cairo, Nairobi, Kenya. Oh my God, my brain. <laughs> Off to a good start tonight, you guys. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for joining. Lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's entirely, entirely our privilege. Yep. Uh, it's, a pleasure. Great. it's a pleasure having you. So to introduce you guys, um, Priti and Prashant are a couple, which I don't know, it's, it's maybe a surprise, but they share the same last name. They are hobby photographers uh, from originally from India. And currently you're based in Nairobi, Kenya for actually for your job, Prashant. You're working in uh, marketing, consumer good marketing, um, a right. job that brings you traveling a lot, you say, but also has an office component. And then the photography is kind of your side gig and, and your hobby. Pretty, you uh, are a German teacher and also a hobby photographer. So today we're going to learn a little bit about how you even started your journey as photographers, which I find really uh, interesting because the quality of your work, I can say that, uh, very um, objectively doesn't tell that you're hobby photographers right it looks very very professional so it will be interesting to hear your background how how it all started and uh, we're excited to to hear more about the approach to your to your teaching journey and you guys everyone that's joining please feel free to ask questions in the chat you can uh, use it to just ask pretty impression anything you'd like to hear from them and i will try and ask them in between uh, they have a little presentation as well so you guys please feel free the the stage is yours <laughs> i'm excited to learn about your work thanks thank you uh, let me share the screen and just let us know if you can see it yes not yet there it goes that looks good perfect i hope awesome. everyone can see the screen yeah, so, um, so like uh, Marian said, I'm Preeti and this is Prashant. And we are hobby photographers uh, with a love to sh uh, of photographing primarily wildlife. And uh, we thought as contributors to Prince of Wildlife, we'd probably be among the few hobby photographers that you have uh, and thought it would be a good idea to maybe share our journey, uh, how we learned photography and the amazing mentors we've had over the years who have helped shape our journey. And so uh, uh, in our experience, what we've learned is that um, as hobby photographers, there's no better way to learn photography than actually traveling with, with an expert. And one such trip that we took, our first actually, was with a South African photographer named David Ridges. It was to Zambia and it was an amazing trip. We were complete novices and uh, well, one of us was actually uh, <laughs> a bit let's say, uh, naive. naive enough to think that uh, go, going on a photo safari with a Blackberry was a good idea. Luckily, David stepped in and convinced Prashant that it was not. And uh, he helped us hire some gear. And that's us with the gear. And uh, needless to say, um, as the saying, or rather as the saying goes, um, oh, it yeah. was... It was, yeah, it was the most amazing way to start a uh, 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 photography journey. Right. And um, I think I think love that so much that over the next few years, we, we, we did a number of sessions with experts uh, in many parts of the world. And we tried a number of things. We tried uh, cityscapes in Dubai, uh, climbing on top of skyscrapers. We tried landscapes across Namibia, South Africa. We got into a helicopter with Gurcharan and, and photographed Lake Magadi. Right. Uh, we tried fine art architecture for a bit with an architecture photographer in, in, in Dubai. So we tried we tried many things. The common theme everywhere was that we traveled with an expert. We went an expert. And, and it amazed us. And if you look back today, every type of photography taught us something new. And, and, and 
And what we've tried to consciously do is to use some of those principles in, in our day-to-day -day photography, right? Even if it's wildlife and not uh, the context they taught us. However, whatever the scene was, even if it was, let's say, a cityscape in Dubai, we always left the scene uh, wondering, you know, we wish there was a lion in there, or we wish there was an elephant in there, because even the best landscapes for us seemed incomplete. Without an animal in it. Without an animal in it, without some kind of wildlife in it, right? So life clearly is our, uh, is our first love in that sense. You have been living in Dubai, no? Have you seen the oryx? Yes. yes. Oryxes, flamingos, lots of flamingo opportunities uh, and great fun with Arabian oryx. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I think our friends came to realize there's actually a lot of wildlife in Dubai if you just go search, search for it or, maybe, or asking us about them. Yeah, correct. Yeah, but the thing is wildlife. Elusive stuff. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know there's even like Arabian leopards, I think, but no one ever sees them. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't, uh, we haven't, we haven't seen the leopard. There's also a lot of people who photograph owls in, in Dubai. Yeah. Sadly, that is one thing we did, could not do in Dubai. Maybe we will actually go back just for the owls, yeah. but not in a rush. We are in Kenya right now. We're not going back in a rush. <laughs> no, you have good opportunities in Kenya. <laughs> yeah, Kenya is not bad. Kenya has a thing to do offer, I think. In, you in, think? <laughs> in, in, in hindsight, yes. Um, yeah, so I think the, the way we're going to structure the rest of rest of this uh, presentation is to is to share key learnings that people have taught us, and and try and show how we've we've done our bit to utilize these things in for us. Yeah, so that's going to be the structure. As usual, of course, any questions are, are welcome. Right. That sounds the, great. Maybe just a short question before you start, because you said you have always traveled with an expert. Does that mean you have? probably like booked photo trips, photo safaris. Is that how you traveled with a photo expert? Yes. So, yeah, so we've done, uh, so the Zambia one was a photo safari, uh, six, six guests and, and one photographer uh, mm -hmm. for six or seven days, right? And each one of these pictures here, right, is actually with a pro photographer with us, right? So mm -hmm. the first one is a rooftop workshop uh, with a guy called Danny Eid, who's a Egyptian uh, landscape and, and uh, Kind of cityscape photographer. Mm -hmm. um, the next three are uh, Namibia, South Africa, with Emil uh, von Maltit and and Nick, who are South African photographers. And and Emil's probably the first guy who taught us actively uh, photography. The the red one is with Gurcharan, right? Uh, who was the first speaker this year uh, for you? Yes. Right. And, and the last one is an architecture, an attempted architecture. We didn't continue with it. Uh, with a photographer called Sajin. Uh, who was also Sharjah, Dubai, UAE-based, uh, a fabulous fine art architecture photographer who's just moved into wildlife. Yeah, interesting. So the same journey like you a little bit. And so did you buy gear then right after that first safari where you only rented your gear or how did that happen? I think we bought gear bit by bit. But the best thing about living in South Africa is that you can, you can hire gear very easily. They, they courier it to doorstep. Right, and uh, the minute you're done with it, you the, 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 the courier guy comes and picks it up from your step as well. So we tried a lot of gear that way uh, before committing uh, to 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 a lens or a body. Yeah, that sounds very smart. So I don't. Sorry, I'm keep interrupting you. So please go ahead and <laughs> kick off the photos because I'm excited to see them as well. <laughs> not all, not all. So I think the first lesson. So we did a we did a street photography workshop or a, or a general photography workshop with a with a, a gentleman called Neville Balsara in in Mumbai, who's a street landscape candid photographer. He refers to it himself, and and he taught us many profound things. But I think this thing that stays us the most, which is every photo, the sum total of all the photographers' experiences up till that moment, right? So what he was trying to say is, it's not what you are photographing. It's what you bring to the photographer, to the mm -hmm. photograph as a photographer, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the reason why, although both us, both of us are often in the same vehicle, we rarely ever make the same photograph, right? We often, we're, we're the same sightings, the same vehicle, the same place. Sometimes shooting from the same side. <laughs> yeah, the same side, the same animal, but very rarely do we get the same photograph, right? And it's because of mine on top, right? Both of us see it differently. We, mm -hmm. I might have zoom lens, she might have a wide angle at that time or vice versa. And you just end up getting very different 
photos, right? And 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 this is an example. Um, you know, uh, both of us saw this line together. Uh, I am a cricket fan. Cricket, this this is what I'm a cricket fan. I am not. Cricket is not. <laughs> I saw this line. It it, it struck me. to be very uh, close in resemblance to this famous uh, british cricketer called wg grace who had this big black beard you know and it just that was a thought that came to my head i just composed this shot as if the guy is standing at the end of the cricket pitch and i'm bowling to him right which is this kind of long runway to the line etc mm-hmm. pre saw him very differently and photographed him very differently Right, but I think she also agrees that this is the better outcome of of of, <laughs> of that an, morning. It also, I think, there's an emotional connect that comes out of the photograph, and yeah, well, this was the better yeah. connect. So it's, it's an example, right, of just you know my fondness for the game, and mm-hmm. you know the connect to uh, a, a legendary sportsman, and how kind of you know then I, I chose that reference to compose this shot this way, right? Obviously, there'd be many ways to compose a seated line. right um so you were leaning out of the car to get that shot i suppose um no not really uh this was no we we tend to travel with vehicles where we take the uh, doors off. the doors off and the seats off as well so that we can lie down low on the on the floor of the vehicle so that's why we tend to get the the low angles as much as possible that's also a good tip i think for in- aspiring wildlife photographers to not just you know like you travel with an expert or a pro but also choose for companies that offer the right vehicles the right kind of gear be it oh, yeah. i don't know bean bags or whatever you might need as a photographer no it's very important and we were thinking about it recently there are many lodges that just for love earlier that we wouldn't go back to because they've got the traditional tourist safari vehicles whereas we now insist on you know low level We can't imagine how we used to go those days. Correct. So and then yeah, the lodges. Uh, we go. With, I mean, uh, we you have restrictions on how much you can take on a flight, so you're not going to go with a filled bean bag. And you go to the lodge and you find they don't know what a bean bag is or what to do with the bean bag. So we actually had to buy in one particular lodge. We had to actually had to buy rice to fill the, fill the bean bag. With. Yeah, we bought rice from the hotel to fill our bean bags. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> um, Just one short question, you guys. Uh, Karl Heinz is writing that the sound, unfortunately, is quite bad, and that your voices are breaking up a little bit. Um, can any anyone else in the chat, please tell us if they have the same problem? Otherwise, I might ask you to to uh, switch to another network again. Uh huh. Silke says same problem. So pretty prescient. Maybe you can change. Uh huh. Pascal also says same same. Okay. It has improved, is what he says. Okay, I don't know in which network you are right now, but maybe try and switch it up one more time. Sure. Okay, let's just try that quickly. They might be gone now for a second, so in the meantime, I'm uh, gonna try and cover <laughs> for that minute while pretty impression switch uh, switch network. Uh, I'm sorry about that. We had a little test session before we uh, went live. 30 minutes and they went back and forth between like the mobile network and the cable network and it didn't always work so let's hope we can make it work again in the meantime please uh, feel free and use the chat and tell me it would be really nice to hear if you guys are also photographers or if you're just following pretty and freshant for their photography hi uh, we are are we back yes you are back and it sounds quite good for me Let's test and keep on uh, talking a bit and see if it if the connection is better. Okay, excellent. So, uh, hopefully, the screen has moved as well to uh, a baby elephant. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so again, just just continuing with the theme. I, both of us, Preeti and I, were the same sighting. Preeti was busy photographing the mother spraying dust all over her, which is another spectacular scene. But I, I saw this baby scudding towards the mother and. uh being a rock and roll fan uh, uh, the rolling stone song give me shelter just kept ringing in my ears and i i, I was trying to create the story of you know the tough trying uh, to to find some shelter and solace uh, in the mother right, in the shot so just another example of how you know uh, my upbringing makes me see things differently from her upbringing 
in a way. And do you have these associations while in the field or like afterwards when editing at the computer or sometimes this way and the, or the other way? Quite often in the field, quite often in the field, but sometimes to be honest, we see it later and it clicks as well. So it's mm -hmm. not always 100% one way or the other. But this particular thing, yeah, I mean, the song was just going in my head uh, at that time. And therefore, I was looking to find this kind of a, this kind of a composition. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. At that time. Yeah. And uh, this one is up in a helicopter uh, with, 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 with Gurcharan. And he just told us that not to just focus on the ones flying, the flamingo flying. These are flamingos in the, in the lake. Mm -hmm. And he told us to also look for seated flamingos. And I just... We were banking, we were turning as, a, as, as the helicopter. And this, when I saw this, it, it reminded me of the movie Independence Day, right? And it's, it's almost like these multiple kind of battleships gearing up to, to fight the alien ship in a way, right? So uh, it's, the, it's the title as well, right? So these, these kind of things just hit us uh, uh, at, at the moment and try and compose it. When we try and even kind of title it uh, or even process it that way. They hit you, uh, pretty Independence Day, probably not your jam so much. <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, not really. No. Same as, uh, so I didn't get the shot. I yes. didn't get the shot. I zoomed in further. Oh, I think now we have lost pretty and percent. I'm really sorry about that, you guys. Um, I hope they'll be back in a minute. So let's see if there's any questions in the meantime that maybe I can also answer. Great to hear, Silke, that uh, this is your way to getting to know Pretty and Prashant. I think that's kind of the thing that we love about Prince for Wildlife, that we do have the chance to feature, you know, emerging photographers, people that are not world-renowned photographers that have been featured in Nat Geo, but also people who just have a really strong connection to wildlife. Our hobbyists do that in their, you know, spare time on the weekends or in their holidays. And they have this incredible body of work that not a lot of people have seen yet. Um, speaking of what no, not a lot of people have seen, maybe I can already spill the beans that tomorrow is going to be a big day because we're going to release uh, the print catalog for this year's edition of Prince for Wildlife. So all of you, if you aren't already signed up to the newsletter, now would be a good moment because tomorrow there will be an email coming to your inbox where you can see the first 90 images that will be on sale as of uh, next week, Sunday. So we're launching on the 28th of August, which is next week, Sunday, at uh, 3 p.m. Central Eastern Time. So um, would be, let me see, 3 p.m. minus six hours would be 9 a.m. Eastern Time in, in the States. Um, that's the moment where the shop will be opened and these 90 prints will be uh, on sale and we know from the last years that prints tend to sell out quickly at least some of them really sell quickly and that's why we decided already last year to make a catalog with the photos so you guys can already browse uh, through the offering and make your selections so you don't spend too much time going back and forth between uh, the prints on offer on on launch day you can already it's a it's a large PDF with all the prints in it. You can you know make little crosses for the ones that that you like. Um, I hope Pretty Impressant will join shortly. In the meantime, please uh, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions about uh, Prince for Wildlife, which I can answer. I cannot answer anything about uh, their work, obviously, but uh, anything you might know want to know about the fundraiser, about what's happening next week, please go ahead and uh, let me know if there's anything. Any burning questions? I'm going to check the chat again. Silke says that's what she really likes about Prince for Wildlife webinars, learning about new photographers and like-minded people. I'm glad. I'm also glad, Silke, I saw you joined. I, I don't know if you joined any, uh, all of them, but I s saw you many times. <laughs> so really lovely that you've uh, made it such an, yeah, such an important thing for you to join every time. It's really nice to have you here. Um, Swati is asking how uh, you can submit for next year's collection. So first of all, uh, let me say it's, it's always, we work from one edition to the next. 
So we cannot make any promises that there will be a next edition. Of course, that's our goal as always, but we still have to make this one work. Uh, this year we had an, an open call like last year as well, where we asked photographers to, to hand in their work. And um, we would probably do the same thing next year. I, again, I cannot make any promises, but the best thing would be to uh, either subscribe to the newsletter or follow Prince for Wildlife on, on social media, on Instagram or Facebook, because that's where we announce uh, when we do the, the open calls. This year we did, I think, two, two or three weeks. So enough time to collect your work and enter it. We did it uh, with the hashtag on Instagram, so quite simple. And we got over 1,000 submissions this year, which was crazy. We were quite uh, surprised by the amount of work that was uh, sent in and submitted. And we made a selection of actually 16 photos uh, from that open call, which will be on sale as of next week. Let me just check if uh, Pretty Infrashant have sent an email that they'll be back. Not yet. Then I just have to cover a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry about this. Yeah, thank you, Swati. So, uh, yeah, for us, the open call is really important because it is, you know, a lot of times, especially in the fundraising world, it's always the big names coming together because, of course, they have, you know, big reach, big audiences, and that sells. But for us, it's really important to be a bit more uh, inclusive and give these opportunities and this uh, visibility to, to more photographers, which are not famous already and which maybe don't have an audience. They don't have 1 million followers on, on Instagram. Of course, we have a few of those as well, but then it, alongside people who are just upcoming photographers who maybe you know don't even use Instagram regularly, but still have great work. Chintan. Uh, where in Nairobi are the prints being shown and sold? So they are not uh, sold or shown in an exhibition or a space physically. It's really just an online fundraiser. So if you uh, want to see them, uh, visit the website. I will put that in the chat. It's printsforwildlife.org. They are not online yet. So um, they're still under wraps. As I said, tomorrow there's going to be um, a catalog as a PDF, which is going to be sent out uh, via email. That's going to be available. But on the website, they're still not online. They will only come go live next week, Sunday, 28th of August. So that's that's where you will see them. We ha have been, you know, we're dreaming of an exhibition at some point. So it would be lovely to, to come to Nairobi and show them. But uh, so far we haven't managed to, to host an exhibition yet. Maybe something for, for next year or the year after. <laughs> ah, I think they're back. Yes, you guys. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, I mean, we felt it was all too quiet and suddenly we realized there's nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I tried to cover as best as I could. So we did talk a little bit about the uh, Prince for Wildlife in the meantime, but of course, everyone's here to see you guys, so. Good that you're back. I'm um, sorry. Uh, where did, where you, did we? Yeah, where did you lose us? So that's a good question. I think, yeah, this one we haven't seen yet and discussed. So I think it kind of broke up after Which we talked you? about Independence Day and Gujaran's aerial photography session oh, with you wow. guys. Oh, so you haven't seen this either? Nope. Oh no, okay. So we've been talking on for a long time then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so, so sorry about this. <laughs> uh, Bobby says, we don't see them yet. For all of you other guys, do you see Pretty and Prashant already? Yes, okay, Silke sees you. Good, Swati as well, Pascal as well, great. So Bobby, I hope it will work for you eventually too. Then uh, yeah, back to you guys. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome back. So the second lesson that a lot of mentors have, have taught us uh, and, and kind of demonstrated to us in the field is, you know, don't go, don't go chasing action constantly in wildlife. It's a, it's a tendency to do so. We get irritated sometimes when the chatter happens on, on the radio. Find a beautiful scene and wait for something to unfold in that scene is, is often a very, very productive way of doing it as well. Right. And, and, and Preeti will explain this particular photo. Um, so this particular photo uh, it was uh, taken in the Mara, 
uh, on this particular day, it seemed like it was raining leopards. We were spoiled for choice. But our photo mentors on this trip were Dilip and Amya Varya. And they took one look at the tree, just the tree with the leopard kill. And that did it for them. They said, we have to wait for it. Because as Dilip put it, if the leopard were to climb the tree, it would make for an amazing frame. And uh, so we did. We waited for six long hours before this leopard finally decided, yeah, it should climb the tree. And when it did, it did make for an amazing frame and uh, made the wait worth it. It's not always happening like that, right? Sometimes you wait for hours and hours and nothing oh. happens. <laughs> which, is yeah. why, which is why when it does happen, there's a little, there's a celebration going on in your head. Yes. Yeah. And you were positioned perfectly as well. Oh, we, so we took many test shots. In fact, Swati was also there for this particular... Uh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, she'll, she'll also tell you about the long wait that we have for this particular leopard. I hope you um, found <laughs> So this uh, scene was from our Zambia trip with David, and he told us that this baobab would make for a great background for any animal, but especially elephants. And luckily, there were elephants close by. So he urged us to wait and watch and see if the elephants would pass by in front of this baobab. And sure enough, when they did, it made for an am such an amazing scene that I actually almost felt quoted to a time past. Because uh, sadly, how way we are going, such scenes might just become a thing of the past. I hope not. I'm an eternal optimist and I hope it won't be. But uh, yeah, I'm just glad I have a scene, uh, uh, an image like this to remind me of good old days. Um, so just checking, are you still with us? Yeah, we're still there, we're still there. I'm just being quiet because I want to have your time now. <laughs> okay, um, so this, uh, for, for those who haven't been to India, uh, this was taken in Kanha National Park and winters there are are truly magical. The thing that really, really struck us were these streams of light coming through the Sal forest. And the, the whole trip, I just prayed and prayed and hoped that we would get some animal in, in this light. The particular day, our guide was busy rushing to a potential tiger sighting. But when I saw this scene as he was driving past with the spotted deer in an open clearing with lights uh, streaming onto it, I asked him to wait, forget the tiger. Couldn't care less about the tiger at, the po at that point. I had, I had to get the stag looking up into the light. Um, well, it didn't really um, look up for a while. So we waited and waited. And I think Prashant stopped shooting by then. Yeah, I was on my phone doing something else. <laughs> When finally it did look up, and when it looked up, God, the, the, the feeling that you have just cannot be expressed in words. So It was worth the wait. Incredible image. Thanks. Um, this image was all thanks to our photo mentor, Andrew Schumann. Uh, this was actually one of our earlier trips, uh, earlier in our journey. And uh, we saw this uh, mother cheetah with its cubs lying, uh, resting under some trees in the shade at midday. So it's really, uh, it's um, midday, harsh light or, and all of that. But Andrew said there was a kill nearby and the cheetah potentially walked towards it through this clearing. And if it did, we should actually try to go for silhouettes today. So we said, hey, why not? So he told us to meet her up the sky, underexpose, and just wait. And that's exactly what we did. And hey, Presco, when it did happen, it was we were we were we were ecstatic, thrilled beyond belief. But then in post-processing, he told us to convert it to black and white. And when we did so, the images took on a completely different um, Dimension. Right? Yeah, dimension. And then it was special for us because that was the first time we actually made, converted an image to black and white and saw the true beauty of black and white. And, and those of you who now know that we predominantly photograph in black and white, right? So this is, this is the first time. It would be interesting actually to, to hear how you see a scene already when you're out in the field. 
do you already process in your mind to black and white and are like, okay, this could work in black and white in color. It wouldn't work maybe because it's too busy or the colors wouldn't match. Is that how you already think? So it, it's, it's not easy because there's the, 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 it isn't, the contrasts aren't naturally enough always, right? In, in, in wildlife photography. And that's really the, the, the learning curve that we've been on. I think again, so we've had a uh, hit and miss where we try out scenes and come back and look at it and realize that it works or not. But we've also had great mentorship, right? So we've had people who have taught us to look for certain things, right? How to identify contrast, how to identify backdrops which convert well to black and white and some that extra, right? Mm -hmm. so, so today, I mean, probably 95, 99% of what we, what we process is in black and white, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Uh, and it, 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 it's, it's a learning curve, right? It, it, I, I guess it, it, it comes over time. Uh, we just genuinely think that most photographs look better in black and white then. So, uh, it's, it's a I personal it's choice. Yeah. And you, so you at, at, it also sells really well on, <laughs> on Prince for Wildlife. Black and white photos always sell really well. Yeah, well, so yeah, <laughs> so then that's an incentive as well, correct? <laughs> cool. So, Next, next lesson, and this is one that uh, uh, Neil, uh, photographer, African photographer we travel with for a lot of landscape work, keeps uh, hammering into our heads whenever, right? I mean, he's a stickler for, for, for the elements approach to, to composing landscapes, right? And, and he keeps driving home a message that, you know, every element in your photograph has to have a reason to be in it. And, and the choice of what you leave out is sometimes even more important as the choice of what you leave in, in the frame, right? And uh, while, of course, he taught us that in a landscape context, uh, we'll try and show a couple of examples of how we put it use in, in, a, in a wildlife context, right? So this is a, a photograph called Innocence that, that Preeti got. Uh, I was, again, doing something else uh, in the vehicle. I don't know what I was doing. But, uh, but, but, but I think Preeti realized that the heart of the story here was, was the eyes and the, and the expression and the gesture of that baby monkey, right? And if we've seen through these photos, the baby monkey has two or three gestures, all of which are quite magical, right? And, uh, you know, she chose to just focus on that and, and kind of show enough of the mother so that all of you understand it's a mother, but you don't see the full mother, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I, on the other hand, what I was saying was, I got a full monkey and, and the baby and the tail and the tree, and it's a pointless photograph, right? Because it's got too many elements. Mm -hmm. Right, I think Preeti really got into the core core element of this photograph, and 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 that's why it works uh, for us. It's beautiful. It does work. Mm -hmm. This, yeah, we call this the trials of a younger sibling. Right, uh, we were watching this 14 strong pride of lions feeding on a on a wildebeest next to the car, and you can imagine it's a gory, noisy, messy kind of sight. Okay, but if you can imagine 14 lions on a wildebeest, you'll realize there isn't space for enough for 14 heads right, to eat. And then we saw this, this one calf, which was out of the eating circle because the feeding is happening somewhere to the, to, the, to the left of the frame. And it's this kind of given up and it's resting its jaws on a, on a sibling and just waiting its turn kind of, you know, wistfully, patiently, you know, almost given up in the world, right? Because all this uh, food... And, and, and feasting happening just a foot away, but you know, as a younger sibling, he just got a way to turn, right? Yeah. So, in, I mean, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, it's like you know, I mean, it's my lot in life, right? So, <laughs> and, and again, it, 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 it's 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 an example of what all we've chosen to keep out of the frame, right? because I guess if you look at it, you can figure out that there are other lines there, and you know, mm -hmm. and, and with the trial, mm -hmm. with the with the title and a bit of explanation, you can get the story. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't think it would have worked if you had got 15 lines there, right? In that do you, might I ask, like, do you crop that already, like, while composing on location, or do you crop in yes, post processing? It was, uh, it was pretty much shot like this. Yeah, this Big. one was. Yeah, I mean, we made the 16 by nine, but it was cropped more or less for the head. Mm -hmm. We were lucky enough to be so close that we could zoom into the head, right? Um, Yes, so speaking is, of is, zooming in, I have to ask now for the gear nerds, which uh, I'm maybe not included, but still interesting to know what kind of lenses 
do you travel with? Do you have multiple bodies and then zoom lenses or do you have prime lenses? What do you mm -hmm. use? So we general rule, we travel with uh, three bodies each, okay, with an ultra wide, like a like a 1635 or a 2470, 2470, 2485 kind of uh, lens on one body each, mm -hmm. uh, a mid range like a 7200, which mm -hmm. is actually Preeti's favorite. Lens. She's always using a 7200. Okay, I've, okay, I've discovered the magic of going in white. 7200 mm -hmm. is her favorite, and then. Uh, Preeti prefers lighter lenses. I can handle heavier lenses, right? So I carry a Fanet Prime and she carries a 200-500 uh, zoom. So I'm waiting for the, now the mirrorless, I'm waiting for them to come up and realize that there are female photographers who also like wildlife and want lighter lenses, want right? Want lighter lenses. It's happening. I think they're slowly coming. Eventually, all these long, nice lenses are coming to mirrorless, native mirrorless market as well. So that's good. Yes, so we are eagerly. I'm eagerly awaiting that because uh, the two five hundred is. I like it. It's nothing compared to say the two four hundred or the or the five hundred prime that Prashant has. Hmm. I'm a little jealous every time I see the clarity on the five hundred. But this one is your shot, right, Pretty? So it's shot on one of those zoom lenses. Yeah, yeah. it's the two hundred five hundred. Uh, so we're yeah. Nikon shooters. We uh, Canon Nikon. So this is the Nikkor two hundred five hundred. Yeah, it looks incredible. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Some light went on. Thank you. <laughs> okay, continue. Then, yeah, keeping with the same theme. I mean, uh, this is from one of the migrations that we've seen uh, in, in, in the Mara. Right? And, 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 you know, you, you, just seeing so many will be, it's, it's safe to guess that it is a migration shot, right? But we were asking ourselves the question once while waiting for a crossing. You know, the migrations are all about masses of wildebeest, right? Thousands of wildebeest. Uh, can we try and document the story of one? Mm -hmm. You know, and we're scanning, we're just scanning around us. And uh, I think both of us got this eventually, but I think this is Preeti's version. Uh, she saw this one kind of almost, you know, petrified stare at the... The eyes, the yeah, eyes. The eyes, right? It's that, you know, and, and, and those of you who've seen a migration or, or read about it, you can imagine... Uh, the the anxiety and, and, and tension that they go through right pre-crossing post-crossing and uh, the idea was to try and document that individual story right yeah. uh, by popping out the rest this one has definitely stared into the abyss of open mouths of yeah. crocodiles and <laughs> other threats yes and, and hopefully survive to tell the tale as well yeah, yeah we don't know <laughs> And then I think the last subject, right, probably controversial, right? I think too many wildlife photographers give Photoshop a bad name, uh, mm -hmm. probably because we have traveled with, let's say, you know, fine art uh, architecture photographers and, and cityscape photographers, or whatever. We've been, in a way, uh, mentored to accept Photoshop as a, as a photographer's friend, right? Uh, obviously, we don't put lions where lions aren't, and, you know, we don't take out mountains, etc. We don't do things like that. But... You know, uh, the, the question we ask is, uh, does, does the tool help us show the image in the way we felt while photographing it? And if it does, then the tool is, 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 is useful, right? And we'll show a few examples of that, right? So uh, we call this Flamingo Noir. I mean, Flamingo is obviously a favorite object of ours, beautiful in white and pink. And we just thought, you know, I mean, as black and white photographers, what will flamingos look like? And we tried one, we liked it. And then he went back to this place and said, let's try and get a reflection and see if it works, right? And uh, well, to our eyes, at least, it, it works, right? And it's a very different uh, view of, of a bird which is known for a color, right? And yet, without color, we, we believe it's, at least to our eyes, as beautiful, right? Uh, and, and, and you can't do this. Of course, you, you, you shoot for it, so you underexpose, et cetera. But mm -hmm. you can't get this eventually without a bit of Photoshop. Um, the next one is an example, right? I mean, uh, lions in the rain, Masai Mara, sun's going down low, right? So we position ourselves together to get backlit rim lighting. Mm -hmm. We slow the shutter to get the rays, right? And we underexpose as well at the same time, right? So, and, and, and the idea was trying to you know, just isolate the elements, right? Just isolate uh, a lioness and isolate the drops. 
right? And she obliged by getting up and, and giving us this classic uh, profile as well, right? Almost like she's not mm-hmm. dampened by the mood around her, right? Yeah. In reality, she was going on for her cubs, but then that doesn't help the story, so. You can even see her eyebrows, which I find fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, no, this was, this was fun. We were trying this for the first time. Uh, We've got two or three more uh, versions, of, this. versions of, of different lines, same thing as a large ride, uh, mm-hmm. same backlighting with rain. Uh, this is the only one we managed to post process so far, but we're going to try the same thing for a series of three or four images from there, and they all look exciting to us, at least. For right? those who know who are Mara, this is the Black Rock Pride. We love yeah. that pride. This is the Black Rock Pride at Black Rock, right? So just next to the, the rocks. Perfect. Um, and if uh, if you say Photoshop is a photographer's best friend, like how much time would you spend on post processing one of those photos? Um, so so so, so l- l- I think it's good to explain how we divide our work as well. Preeti is the is the post processing among the two of us, right? Uh, I'm, I'm I market it. She does the work. Um, <laughs> I'm a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to the the shot uh, to come when it comes to post processing so i will do it for maybe half a day one photograph and then i will leave it for bits that I, ha- I can come back and look at it objectively and then i will again work on it to uh, work on the bits that don't please me at that point so i might work on a photograph over uh, over uh, two three days before i am happy with the with what i have done so that's yeah. photographs like this Mm-hmm. Right, simpler photographs are so much faster. Yeah, so, so something like this will take time. Uh, uh, some uh, some others, uh, like say the last photo on this slide, the the two giraffes. Um, quick. It was quick. I mean, it yeah. was. It, sometimes everything just works perfectly, and it's just a quick touch up here and there. And sometimes uh, a room is enough. But yeah. uh, I just feel that photo, uh, Photoshop gives me that slight edge, even if the processing is easy. And then for for stuff like this, Photoshop is a friend, I would say here. And also Photoshop, you have self-taught yourself, or you had also experts giving courses. Mentor, or... yes. the same, the same, the same with the mentors, right? So we hound them and. Uh, we we asked them for post processing trip tips and they're very happy to help as well so the, so that's that's the uh, that's the beauty of going on trips like this uh, no trip is complete it's not just on field teaching it's also off field teaching off field where they tell you what is good about the, they help you analyze the image that you've taken and then how mm-hmm. to process it. so brendan kramer for instance was a was a mentor for lightroom he mm-hmm. just helped yeah, us and I- that kind of Lightroom workflow is basically his workflow, right? So, you know, we didn't rethink it because it's so simple and due to us, right? Yeah. And, and this photo, I mean, I mean, Dili Pandika, right? He's the guy who really uh, taught us on how to get this kind of a look going, right? Mm-hmm. We, we photographed it, didn't have the skills to get it to this, this level, right? But he was very happy to sit with us and, and just tell us how to approach it, uh, you know? And the, tr- the tricky bit here is getting the raindrops on the body of the lion. That's the that's the trickiest bit, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it was it was fun. It's lovely to hear. I think that's kind of the beauty of the wildlife photography sphere. That it's also very it can be competitive as well, but then it's also collaborative in some sorts, and people sharing their ideas and their workflows and knowledge is beautiful. Yeah, we've been I, we've been lucky to find the people who are willing to share. Right, yeah, we've heard stories we... about people who don't. We haven't met them as yet, thankfully. <laughs> uh, we've been very fortunate to find people who are very happy to share. Yeah, that's great. Hmm. Yeah, the, the the next one is another favorite of us. Again, it's one of Preeti's. Uh, this was our first ever tiger sighting uh, wow. in India, and uh, literally, I mean, when when the tiger walked past, both our jaws were on the ground. Right, Preeti had the presence of mind to lift her jaw and, and take a photograph. Right, <laughs> but when we went home. Uh, the color just didn't work for us, right? We, we thought, you know, the color was a nice photograph of a lion walking on an embankment, but it did not capture how we felt, right? When we, our first tiger, when we, when we saw our first tiger, literally we thought time stopped still, right? Our heart stopped, everything had stopped. It was kind of, you know, 
this magnificent beast is by oblivious of all the the vehicles around it and we felt that the color just did not do justice to how we felt right when this photograph was taken and then preeti just you know i went to work one day and preeti started tinkering right yeah sometimes it's just about i mean you know there is potential to the photo you just don't know what it is and the photo this was again early on in in the photoshop journey so i was just playing around and then i actually stumbled upon this how it, what it would look like and i just kept at it so back then it would have, it took me a long long time to get this particular output but um, yeah, i think uh, I, i'm pretty pleased with the, with the result it's beautiful i have to tell you i mean you cannot see the chat at this moment but you're getting so many lovely comments in the chat from uh, love this shot to beautiful majestic tiger gorgeous lion your photos are amazing then uh, wow. vivek chindal says we can feel what you felt just by looking at the picture so uh, you know it's lovely to see how this uh, translates and uh, arrives thank at the audience. <laughs> thank you thank you very much um yeah and then just for a bit of fun right uh, lucy in the pool with diamonds i'm a beatles fan right and uh, we were uh, we were waiting for some pose by a pool and trying to wait for those spots that they do right and try and get you know uh, uh, just black background and and just the the spots in 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 white right when mm-hmm. um, when i saw this when there was this kind of the spray in the spray in the pond uh, side lighting right and this hippo formed this little kind of circular gesture and you know i just i just took the shot and said you know let let let's give it a preeti and see what she can do <laughs> right and uh, uh, yeah and, 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 then, and then and preeti call the leap yeah the preeti call so that's that that's how this thing works and he got excited as well because it was he said it was a print kind of a frame from what we now we see and then yeah that this is what they created so again i mean it's uh, it's it's different right it uh, i think i think in general the genre of black and white because it's unnatural it makes you think about that photo a little bit more it makes you engage with your brain a little bit more mm-hmm. uh, because you ne- you can you cannot see a black and white thing in real life because real life is color right and therefore mm-hmm. you need to process it a little bit more and i think when we add additional elements like this it kind of increases the kind of engagement to the photo at least so that's how we think of it right um, yeah and also i think maybe to add the this concept of what is reality even is something that is you know you cannot watch it as a narrow space it's not like you, you said reality is in color yeah for us yeah. for human eyes right but for many animal right. eyes reality is black and white so there there is no objective reality so to speak at least uh on an an elemental planetary earth level let's put it that way maybe there is a universal reality but we're yet to experience and see that absolutely right and 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 until we experience that there's always photoshop <laughs> exactly <laughs> we'll have uh, to help we everybody yes <laughs> yeah and 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 finally uh, hallelujah um so this um this particular scene we came across uh, this mother and calf uh, in an open uh, open setting and this calf being a little brave was uh, had stepped away a bit of a distance from its mother and we love for photographing mother a child interaction so we waited for the moment when the, uh, the calf would return to its mother but the set and folded was something that even we could not have imagined in our wildest dreams these three ox peckers just took off when the calf came near and almost it, it almost seemed as if they were singing hallelujah at the reunion and yeah so i i'm just grateful to have been able to take this photograph and this is our contribution to prince for wildlife for this year well, and yeah. um, we hope that uh, it will help in some small way to meet yeah. your meet yeah. your target yeah so this is for the work that you have going yeah this is an incredible image thank you so much you two for donating this image to to this year's edition of prince for wildlife we're really glad to have it um as uh, i said when you were gone for a little while we will release a print catalog um tomorrow where all the prints are going to be uh, finally on display so people can see yours alongside 
89 other images that will be on sale as of uh, next week, Sunday, as of the 28th of, of August. And we're really glad to have you on board. I hope you're still here. Your image is kind of frozen, but uh, I think your sound is still there. So yeah, maybe we can, we can see you. We can see very well. Perfect. Uh, Sorry, the internet has not been our friend. Like no, <laughs> not tonight, but I think we, we managed to uh, come for your presentation, see all your incredible photos and get the stories behind it. So it was really lovely to also, you know, get to know your thought process, your creative process. You do call yourself photo artists. And I think this comes through in this presentation. You could tell like how much work and how much creative thoughts go into, into your work. So... At this stage, um, please, um, everyone, if you have any follow-up questions to, to Priti and Prashant, use the chat, let us know. So far, there were no questions, but only a lot of compliments for you guys, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is beautiful. So thank you as well. Um, in, uh, yeah, in that sense, I would love to have, I have one question for you guys. If you have some tips, some advice that you would give an aspiring wildlife photographer, someone, you know, who hasn't built a body of work like you guys or like professional photographers that have made it their career, like what would you give as an advice? Sure, I can, I can go first and please uh, jump in. I, mean, I Personally for me, right, I mean, I think the, the first question to ask yourself is, are you trying to document what you saw or are you trying to document what you felt? Right, the first question to ask, right? And uh, if, if it's the first, then you're a kind of a documentary photographer. You're, uh, you know, you're, you're just going for realism and you're going for, you know, action and drama and, 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 and all of those, right? Which is fantastic. You can ask the photograph that way, right? We're just not built that way. Right? We, we follow the second thing. And, and the question we really ask is, how did we feel when we saw it? Right. And, uh, you know, and therefore we, we make what we make, but nothing's good and nothing's bad. They're both different genres. The first so, one is probably the large way of work. Right? I think that is the important question to just ask yourself, what yeah. is the image that that appeals to you? What kind of image appeals to you? And then uh, so like what we would have, uh, we would put up photos that inspire us and we would try to try to understand what is it in that photograph? that appeal to us and in that journey we we discovered that we don't want to go after the lion kill and i mean exciting you call us and say there's a lion kill and if there's nothing else to shoot we'll be there to see it <laughs> but would we then come back and post process that no, no but, we'd, we'd probably shoot uh, the cup waiting for the feed right rather than the male chopping on the beast right so but that's us that's us yeah. So very, very figure, cool. out, I say, figure out what you want to photograph and then go for it. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no there's no shortcut. Practice perfect. We've been at it for a while. We don't have as much, we haven't done as much time as say, a professional. Um, so it's taken us uh, some time to get to the stage that we are at. But just keep at it. No, and also I think, you know, uh, uh, we genuinely believe, right? Kind of widen your don't don't bracket yourself. Right? Don't say I'm a wildlife photographer and do only wildlife. Right? Photograph, photograph all kinds of things, chat with all kinds of people. I think what you learn from different people is this is this amazing. We also we, there's, there's phenomenal videos on YouTube, right? Uh, there's phenomenal videos on YouTube of great photographers sharing their experiences, you know, and, and they're extremely uh, educational, right? So. Mm -hmm. So you spend some time watching. I mean, like Michael Medford has this video called The Qualities of Light, right? Where he gives you this rule saying never shoot front lit subjects unless you're shooting a, a rainbow, right? Always look for side lighting and backlighting and, you know, uh, diffuse lighting, etc. Dramatic lighting. It's a, it's a beautiful video to watch, right? And he shows examples of, right? There's another, uh, there's another uh, a video on, on, on the visual design of a photograph, right? I mean, how do you visually use elements to, to tell a story? So there's this plenty of fantastic videos from great photographers on YouTube. I would say spend, spend time uh, watching them and re-watching them. You'll learn a lot. That's lovely advice. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, there, there have been a few more questions. So if you don't mind spending a few more minutes uh, together, then uh, Pascal has asked if there's any animal or scene on your wish list. 
Well, I really like jackals. I still haven't got a good jackal shot uh, photograph. So I'm hoping someday to be able to do that. Um, yeah, that's my... Ever since I've been a kid, I've been obsessed by bears. Bears are my favorite, favorite animal and ever. Unfortunately, Africa has no bear. Not yet. Yeah. Yes. Africa has no bears. And the the <laughs> but you might be able to go to Alaska with some of our incredible contributors and also go on a guided photography trip there. Would be a yeah. someday, someday. Alaska, Kanatka. So I keep whenever I'm in a, whenever I'm in a bit of a fuzz, I I read up websites of bear photography trips and I feel better. <laughs> then I hope it will happen for you in reality, reality, you know, at some point um, as well. Then uh, another question came in from Kaya, who's asked, what is the distinction between a professional photographer and this work you describe as a hobby? <laughs> it's a good question, actually. Maybe it's just the money aspect uh, of it. <laughs> yeah, this, I think it's the money yeah, this work doesn't pay our bills. I think that's the only difference. Yeah, but this would be a question that I also had ahead of this uh, talk. Like, is there any chance you are transitioning from hobby photographer to professional and paid photographer at some stage? I mean, you do have the work, you do have the talent. What's stopping you? <laughs> I think we're not ruling it out. We're not ruling it out. Uh, I think we've always uh, kind of double guessed and triple guessed just how good we are or whether we're good enough. Right, which is probably the opposite of an entrepreneurial mindset, but that, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a thing we consider and, 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 and maybe someday soon we'll take yeah, the plunge. I mean, honestly, there's nothing better than, do, than doing what you love. And it's just, this, this, this passion is just increasing. So yeah, we'll, we'll give it a shot sometime soon, hopefully. I mean, there is already an offer here in the, in the chat by Chinta and Gohel, who said that uh, if you would be willing to offer mentorship or workshops for aspiring Kenyan photographers, he's asking, he, I think it's a he, on behalf of Nature Photographers Club of Kenya. So maybe sure. you get in touch with Chinta and see <laughs> if there's some job waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I mean, uh, all, always happy to. Right? Always happy to, yeah. All, always yeah. happy to. We've, like... We've been, we've been fortunate to find people who've been very willing to share. Right? And it would be, and, uh, be a dishonor to them by not passing it on. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I think that would be lovely if you guys, I mean, you from what I can see now from your presentation, there's a lot of skill behind these photos that you could share with other photographers as well. So uh, please, uh, Chintan, maybe uh, best to connect with Pretty and Prashant on their Instagram account. I have copied it in the chat, but I will put it in there again, just so you can directly uh, be in touch and see if there's a chance to, to work together and offer some mentorship programs or, or workshops for, for Kenyan photographers, which would we would also very much appreciate because we always want to feature more, more local photographers, more African photographers, also on Prince for Wildlife. So we're looking for new talents, definitely. Um, Pretty Prashant, it was lovely having you in uh, in this live talk. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, for your work, and again for um, contributing to this year's edition of uh, Prince for Wildlife. Thank you for your time. If you have any last words to say, now is your chance. And uh, thank you for everyone else for joining as well and, and watching tonight. I think just thank you. It's been entirely our uh, privilege and our honor to be uh, part of on this, this initiative that you've started with Piat. Yeah. And yeah, what you're doing is amazing. So yeah, if people following could actually buy a print, then that is a way to forward to help the wildlife that we love to photograph as well. So just something to see that they remain for not just us, for the next generation. Yes, and that's where the circle closes and that's the loveliest thing about Prince for Wildlife that it's giving in each direction, right? It's giving to people who, who donate because they're getting these wonderful photos and prints. And then it's also giving back to nature and to wildlife and to the communities that live in these incredible ecosystems or around these ecosystems in Africa. So it's a very um, holistic and sustainable thing, which we love doing. And thank you again to the both of you for joining. And yeah, I'll close the, the, the live talk at this stage. Thank you for your time. 
everyone. There are two more live sessions planned for, for next week, one with Marcus Westberg, who has joined the elephant translocation in Malawi recently that African Parks did um, uh, in Liwande. It's going to be some incredible, interesting stories. And then the last live chat of uh, this year is going to be with Matt Todd, who is on the UK board of African Parks. It's going to be a bit of a Q&A session where you guys can ask you know, what's happening, what is African Parks doing, really get to know more of the works of, um, of AP. So both hopefully really interesting sessions to come. Sign up, make sure to join again and uh, pretty present. Thank you again and have a wonderful Thank evening you. or rest of the day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Ciao.